Hello, Frontline. This is Val. I'm here with part two of clinical trial design. Uh, we left off talking about inclusion and exclusion criteria. And on this last bullet point, there's just a couple of short things I'd like to say. One is pregnancy or the desire or ability to get pregnant often excludes people from clinical trials. So this often ends up excluding all women of childbearing age. Um, the cynical uh, point of view on this is that fetuses are more important than women, but the less cynical point of view on it is that nobody wants birth defects um, due to investigational drugs. So um, oftentimes exclusion criteria could be desire to get pregnant, but you might occasionally run into um, uh, you know, inclusion criteria that is women of childbearing age who have a, you know, a reliable birth control. Um, so the other thing I wanted to say here is comorbid conditions is a fancy way of saying other diseases. So if the investigational drug is known to be hard on the liver and the person who's entering the clinical trial or wants to enter the clinical trial has hepatitis C might not be a good fit because it might be too hard on the liver for that person. Um, so more about clinical trial design. This is about uh, the different phases of clinical trials. So at different phases, we are looking for different things. Phase one trials test a small group of healthy volunteers, um, 20 to 80 volunteers, and this helps us to evaluate safety, determine dosage range, and um, start to look for side effects. Phase two trials are given to a larger group of volunteers, and those are usually people who have the disease we're trying to treat, um, uh, to see effectiveness, that's the primary thing, to see if it actually works. If it's found that it actually works, then it moves to phase three trials. This is a much larger group, a thousand to three thousand people, um, again, who you almost always who have the disease, um, and this helps to confirm effectiveness, monitor side effects, and do head-to-head -head studies of currently used treatments for the same thing. How do they stack up? If it passes all of these phases, then it goes into phase four, which is often known as post-marketing studies. Um, and so this is after approval, it continues to be studied to see kind of, um, you know, real life use uh, and start to examine long term side effects, not just short term side effects. Uh, but obviously, there, we're, this is not zero right here. Um, these drugs have almost always spent years being tested in animals. So, um, you know, we're not starting from scratch. Um, more about clinical trial design. Studies often compare two or more groups of participants who receive a different treatment to see which is more effective. Um, and some studies are unblinded, but a lot of them are blinded studies. Um, and so an unblinded study is where both the doctor and the patient know, the, know what the patient is getting. In blinded studies, there's a couple of different flavors of blinded studies. Single blind studies are studies where the doctor knows which um, you know, formulation or whatever it is that the participant is getting, the participant doesn't know. And then double blinded studies are where both the doctor and the participant do not know the drug that the participant is getting. And the reason that we, that blinded studies are standard is that the knowledge of a drug, what drug someone is getting, might influence the study results. Um, and for that same reason, in a double blinded study, patients may receive a placebo, a fake pill, also known as a sugar pill. And um, this is a small bullet point, but a big point. Um, it is unethical to give someone a placebo if there is a known better treatment available and that person is going to suffer or get sicker if they don't have the treatment. So if there's, if the point of the study is we don't know if this is effective or not and there's nothing else that works for this disease right now, it's not unethical to give placebos in a clinical trial in that instance. But if it's known that the participants will suffer if they don't have the treatment, um, then it would be unethical to give someone a placebo in that situation. So 
these are sort of societal benefits or the overall benefits of clinical trials. Um, obviously, learning about new drugs with potential their individual potential benefits, drugs that are stronger, that work better, that have fewer side effects, and that you have to take fewer of them to make everything work well. Um, we also want to learn about older drugs and new ways to use older drugs or what drugs should be outmoded. Um, uh, oftentimes, uh, drugs are compared head to head um, to see which drug is better. Um, there are also individual benefits to participation, that is, benefits for an individual, so um, access to state-of-the-art treatment with the potential health benefits if the treatment works, um, the sense of or like contribution of helping others by contributing to medical research, um, possible financial compensation for time and effort. Um, travel is almost always covered in these um, clinical trials, but uh, it's fair warning, the bigger the financial compensation, likely the higher the risk. Um, so that's something to be aware of. And some people make a living doing high risk clinical trials. Healthy volunteers do um, clinical trials for cash um, kind of a lot. It happens. Um, and I'm, well, we're glad that it happens. Those people. Uh, weigh and accept a certain amount of risk um, so that others can benefit. Um, participants in a free trial or in a clinical trial are usually provided free drugs and blood work and this could be a big benefit for someone who is uninsured or otherwise can't pay for medication. Um, and another benefit is that someone might have more frequent monitoring and advanced tests done that they wouldn't get done otherwise. Um, Later in the class, we'll talk about therapeutic drug monitoring, which is a um, yeah, a way of testing how well a medication gets distributed throughout the body. That's almost never done in the U.S. anyways, except for in clinical trials. Um, or if, um, you know, if it's indicated and there's sort of a protocol set up for it already as, as part of treatment. Um, so there are also benefits specific for people living with HIV and AIDS. Um, so obviously better and safer drugs than what we currently have available is um, something that people are always on the lookout for. Um, we always want something new coming down the pipeline, um, at least at this point we do. Um, the clinical trials can provide options for people who have resistance to all or most of the currently available HIV meds. Um, and there's a big benefit here of developing treatments for related infections, that is, opportunistic infections. Um, and again, small bullet point, big idea. Um, in 1995, there was a Bactrim trial that definitively proved that PCP was treatable. Before that, we didn't know. And th so this, the a single trial substantively improved both the health and the quality of life of people living with HIV because we were able to treat a nasty opportunistic infection and we learned that we were able to prevent it um, in people who hadn't yet had it. So obviously all clinical trials have risks and we talked about this at the beginning, but there's a um, kind of continuum of unpleasant to serious to life-threatening side effects. Um, and that's real. Uh, there's There are risks inherent um, in this uh, process. The risk uh, the second bullet point here is treatment may not be effective for the patient. It may be effective for other people and not the patient, or it may not be effective for anybody. Again, we do clinical trials because we don't know and we want to know. Um, then the third point here is that the protocol may require more time and attention than would be required if they weren't participating, i.e. it can be a total pain in the ass. So this is a list of some questions if someone is in considering uh, participating in clinical trials, these are some of the questions that the informed consent is supposed to answer. Um, and if it doesn't, you want to make sure to ask. Um, obviously, participation in clinical trials is voluntary. Someone can withdraw from a study at any time. Um, there is a 
you know, individual benefits as well as societal benefits to participating in clinical trials. There are also individual risks to um, participating, and only an individual can decide for themselves. Um, if you're interested in Philadelphia Fights clinical trials, um, this is the contact information, um, and uh, we would be very happy to hear from you. Thanks for your time. Take care.